It's now my pleasure to welcome to the rostrum Sheikh Ibrahim Mogra. Uh, Ibrahim Mogra is an imam from Leicester, and talking to him just a little earlier on, I know he's travelled especially down from Leicester today to be with us. He was elected as an Assistant Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain in 2008. He is Chair of the Council's Interfaith Relations Committee. Uh, the Sheikh was born in Malawi in 1965 into a fa family of Gujarati Indian origin and emigrated to the United Kingdom when he was aged 18. He was educated at Darul Ulum in Bury and Greater Manchester <coughs> at Al-Hazar University in Cairo and undertook postgraduate studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, SOAS. As a local community activist in Leicester and a national leader in the MCB, Sheikh Mogra has been at the forefront in deepening interfaith relations in the United Kingdom and around the world. He is chair of Religions for Peace UK and an advisory board member of the Three Faiths Forum. He is also a member of the Congress of Imams and Rabbis for Peace and the Christian Muslim Forum. Sheikh Mogra has made regular contributions to the media, voicing concerns and opinions of British Muslims and presenting a holistic view of Islam to the national discourse. You're extremely welcome to be with us today. We welcome you to the podium. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I begin in God's name, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Your graces, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, my religion, Islam, encourages me to share it with the people of the world and to invite people to consider it as a way of life for themselves and as a religion for themselves. But the manner in which I have to do it is also very strictly prescribed, that it should be done with wisdom, with kind words, and when I debate and dialogue, I should do it in the best way possible. The Quran is very clear that there is no compulsion in religion. Forced conversions of people to Islam is unacceptable. Jurists throughout the world have a unanimously held position that anyone who is forced to take up Islam, their conversion is not acceptable. The Quran also tells us very categorically that we say to people of different religions that to you is your religion and to me is my religion. The Quran also tells us that it is God's plan and God's design that he has made us all different. He invites us to ponder over the diversity of our tongues and our colors. In that are signs of God's presence. The Quran tells us that if God so wanted, he would have made all of us the same. In a very interesting verse, the Quran talks about the need for all of us to stand up for each other's rights, to defend each other's rights, to stand up against the tyranny of tyrants and the oppressors. And it states, were it not for the case that people stood up for each other and defended each other, then temples, synagogues, churches and mosques would be destroyed as a result of tyranny. And it's very interesting that in the same verse, places of worship of different religions are mentioned by God to demonstrate that it is God's design that we have all these different religions. The blessed messenger Muhammad, peace be on him, said that you cannot be a Muslim. That person cannot be a Muslim from the harm of whose tongue and hands other people are not safe. So there is a question that needs to be answered. If that is the case, if that is what Islam teaches, then why do we have what is happening in the world today? Why do we have a list of many countries which are predominantly Muslim populated, where people's religious freedoms are trampled upon 
in such brutal ways? To my mind, the answer is very straightforward. We must not conflate what some Muslims do with what Islam teaches. I have spelt out for you what Islam teaches. And we witness on television screens what Muslims do. They are poles apart. The Middle East is the cradle of Christianity. For many years I have lamented the emptying of these lands of its Christian populations. The former Archbishop Lord Williams, with our current Archbishop, with my dear friend and brother, His Grace Bishop Angelos, and many other Christian leaders. I have lamented this fact that the Middle East is poorer without its Christian population. Christianity was there first. Islam came later. Muslims came later. And they lived together for centuries, peacefully, in cooperation and in harmony. And here I would like to ask a question to our politicians and to our government. When Christians and others are persecuted, including Muslims around the world, it is only right that we give them a safe haven. And we welcome them to our islands and give them safety and a home where they could live in peace and in safety. However, the question I would like to ask is, this attitude that we have had of being hospitable and humanitarian in welcoming persecuted people to our country, what role has that played in speeding up the emptying of those countries of its Christian populations? So it's imperative for us as governments, indeed our own government, to ensure that the right political climate is created in those countries so that peace returns, safety and security is maintained, and these populations who've had to leave their ancestral homes can feel safe and secure to return to their homelands and rebuild their lives. Otherwise, the Middle East will lose every Christian and every other decent individual who wants to live in harmony and peace with people of different or no religions. What is happening today around the world, perpetrated by Muslims, is not Islam. And that has clearly been demonstrated by speakers before me who have had to use a word before the word of Islam. They've had to say extremist or some other word, clearly demonstrating that they recognize that Islam, in its true spirit, is a religion not of tolerance, but of respect, where it recognizes the value of the other in a world that has been made diverse by the Creator Himself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.